So we got the marker board up here again, so we got some work to do. Um, unfortunately, uh, for some of you, maybe you feel like that's a, a bad thing. I hope it's not. I want to tell you why uh, we have these words written up here that we do first. I want to bring you into where we're headed in Matthew chapter 6. We're in the Sermon on the Mount, of course. Uh, we have several times stopped and given the context of where we're at historically, geographically. We want you to be connected to this real-life event of Jesus in the hills of Galilee, proclaiming to the people this Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you can see that in previous sermons. You also can see that through the Bible Project. They're highlighting right now, uh, week by week, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, its historical context, and uh, even the, the language and the uh, structure of the Sermon on the Mount. It's all very insightful. We have talked about that from week to week. We have new people uh, coming frequently. And so um, I just want you to know we don't have the time to put you in the context every week. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount for, I think this is our 18th week. So um, if you want to know more about those things, that historical context, we have uh, several sermons in the past where we've talked to that. And then, of course, the Bible Project is a great resource. Today we move into Matthew chapter 6, uh, an ongoing uh, study of the Sermon on the Mount. This week, I found myself on a phone call that I think God in His uh, providence uh, brought about just as we were preparing to enter into this topic. There's a ministry called Cross Point Ministries. It is out of Cincinnati. And over the last three to four years of my journey, just as a human and in particular as a pastor, um, I have been trying to understand the inward things about myself, the emotional needs that I have, the uh, inadequacies that I have, the uh, bitterness or anger or those things that are kind of underneath the surface as I desire to be a more faithful husband, a more faithful father, a more faithful friend, a more faithful pastor. And so through that time, it has been Cross Point Ministries, which I was referred to by somebody else who's been walking me, with me through most of that. I have a therapist. He's actually a counselor, but I call him a therapist because he's therapeutically informed, and sometimes we need therapy, so that's what I call it. I know that he's technically a counselor, so if that offends anybody who's worked really hard to get that official uh, therapist, the degree required to, to actually be called that, I'm sorry. I know he's not one. Um, but he is a very good counselor, the man that I've been speaking with. Our next six sermons cover Matthew chapter 6. We're going somewhere. We're going to this crescendo, which we'll see in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27 and beyond. You maybe have heard these verses before. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, more value, are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? We're going to spend six sermons here. They'll be broken up by Easter. We'll probably take about two weeks off during Easter. So it might be over the next eight weeks. We'll, we'll preach six sermons. We'll encounter six teachings in this chapter six in the Sermon on the Mount. But it all builds to that. To Jesus saying to his audience, do not be anxious. Now my therapist, counselor, talks about little a anxiety and big a anxiety. And I want to make that clear as we venture into this discussion that there is a difference. The big a anxiety, when he uses that terminology, he's talking clinically. That there is such a thing as anxiety disorder or general anxiety disorder. In fact, the National Institute of Mental Health would say this. They'd say occasionally anxi occasional anxiety is a normal part of life. So, right, like little a anxiety, we all have experienced that churning, right? Whereas there's a difference. Many people, again, this is little a anxiety. Many people worry about things such as health, money, or family problems. But there is big A anxiety. I want to be clear on that. But anxiety disorder, the National Institute of Mental Health says, anxiety disorders involve more than temporary worry or fear. 
For people with an anxiety disorder, the anxiety does not go away and can even get worse over time. The symptoms can interfere with daily activities such as job performance, schoolwork, and relationships. There are several types of anxiety disorders, including generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and various phobia-related disorders. Now, you didn't come here for a mental health class, but I think it's important that we clarify what we're talking about in the next six parts of this series, that what Jesus is getting at when we come to the end of Matthew chapter 6 is more in that category of little a anxiety and not in that big A anxiety camp, which requires professional help and and people to walk alongside you who give you the right tools and the the right uh, resources to walk through it. Okay, so I just want to be clear of that. So we don't walk out of here with any false narrative about there not being a place for therapy, there not being a place for medication, there not being a need for all of those things. Jesus is talking more in the line of that little a anxiety that you and I experience every day of our lives or, or throughout our lives. John Mark Comer says it like this. He he talks a lot about how we live in a world with a digital nervous system. Have you noticed that? We're in a world with a digital nervous system. So we are sensor sense are we are sensory aware through our phones and our TVs and our computers of a thousand and thousands of things to be anxious about. They come to us through this digital nervous system. And what we live in is a world of ambient little a anxiety, right? It's like it's everywhere. Those worries about health and money and the world around us and all the different things that we can be anxious about. So when we come to the end of Matthew chapter 6, we're going to hear Jesus telling us that as we grow into greater trust in our Father to provide our deepest emotional needs, it will be a balm of comfort in the midst of our little a anxiety. And what I hope is that we see that the five sections leading up to that passage that we're not going to get to for five sections, it's not disjointed. Jesus is laying the groundwork to be able to say that to you. To be able to say your emotional needs matter. You're hardwired with them. They're inside of you. And, and the fact that you're not finding your fulfillment of those emotional needs in Jesus and in the, your Father God is what's leading you to make a mess out of your religion, to make a mess out of, of how you seek these things out. And so that brings us to the marker board, right? Because um, Crosspoint Ministries, if you can't see it over here, I'll help in people who can't see it on the sermon audio. But we have basic emotional needs. Every human has them. This is just the truth. This isn't like, I mean, it doesn't have to be these exact words or this exact ways of talking about it, but we all have basic emotional needs. And so psychiatrists, those who are professionals in mental health, they'll make these lists differently. So this isn't like the end all list. But if you were to talk to someone from Crosspoint Ministries, and this has been my experience, so I'll just help us with this. I think they're helpful things to hold on to. We have a need for belonging. We want to be seen. We want to be soothed, right? Think about a baby in their first 18 months of life. This is where a lot of this comes to be either rightly received or not rightly received. We have a a need to be seen, a need to be soothed, a need to be safe. That's what that soothing, that being seen, the baby cries, the mother, the father sees it. They come to the baby, they soothe it, they bring it into that safe space, and then we need to be secure. That means we believe it can happen again. So it's like a weaned child, right? A child becomes weaned. That's them becoming secure that, hey, when I cry out, my parents will meet me in that place. This is a basic human reality for everyone. This is in us. It's in our bodies. It's in our souls. And then we also have an emotional need to matter. We have an emotional need for significance, for competence. We're going to explain all these as we go along for control or autonomy would be a, maybe a better way of understanding that, and for affirmation. We're almost there. This isn't, a, this isn't a emotions class. I'm laying the groundwork for us today. What happens with anxiety, which we come to the end of chapter 6, is in the moments we fear that these needs, these emotional needs, are being unmet, 
We struggle with worry and little a anxiety. It's just the way of it. And Jesus is going to meet us there. Jesus is going to meet us there in that place of real life emotional needs. He's going to do it through several examples. The first one that we're going to see is the example of how we religiously give. He, he's going to tie it to our religion primarily in this chapter and how we, we male function in the way we do religion and how that's rooted in us going to the wrong places to see our emotional needs. Met. Today, specifically, we'll see that being seen as significant in the eyes of the world is not the true reward that we should be seeking in our generosity. Instead, the free reward, free reward of being seen as significant in the eyes of God, our Father, through the generous sacrifice of Jesus, becomes an unshakable foundation for our humble generosity. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus is going to give three cautionary examples in the coming weeks. They all have to do with our religiosity, our practicing of our religion, our practicing of our holiness and righteousness. The first is the example of generosity. Here's a baseline reality that we must carry with us through this whole conversation, though, and that's this. You find it in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Know that about God. He doesn't need you. That's not harsh. This is meant to be comforting. He doesn't need you to do things for him. He invites you to be with him. Big difference. Big difference. He invites you to be with him, and as you're with him, have all that you need, including these emotional needs, met in his presence, and then he calls you out into the doing. You don't do it for him. He doesn't need you to show up at church, right? Like, like the kingdom is not going to fall apart if you're not here. It's not that weak. It's not that broken. Right? God's not that incapable. He's not asleep at the wheel. He doesn't need you. He invites you. He's not served by human hands as if, as if he needed everything. Instead, it's this way. Since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way through him and find him, their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Our God is present. Our God is near to us. And those of us who seek to be in his presence first, instead of seeking to do something for him to impress him first, will find in him all that we need. This matters substantially to the ongoing conversation because as God, Jesus calls his people away from religious performance, we must trust that even when we don't religiously perform the way that we tend to think we should, God still is with us. We struggle with this because it requires humility. It requires owning our limitations because we're like, hey, if I can, everywhere else in life, if I can outperform everyone else, most of the time, my politics get involved sometimes, but if I can outperform everyone else, I'll get that promotion or I'll get that starting position on the team or I'll get, add in whatever. Performance-based living. In the kingdom, it doesn't work that way and we have to let go of our need to perform. It requires humility. Our ego gets in the way. Watch this. This is about generosity. Jesus starts in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward for your, uh, from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward." Beware, he says, don't be a hypocrite in your generosity. This is the basic understanding of this passage, right? These emotional needs underlie it. We'll come back to that. But the basic surface level teaching here is don't be a hypocrite as you're generous with others. 
There are those who give. There are those who are generous. For whatever resources they decide to be, including these hypocrites, as Jesus calls them in this passage, their giving is transactional. It's a transactional approach to generosity. They give what they determine is the best thing to give, but they expect in return the praise of others. Transactional. And this leads to some really silly behavior because historically, truly, they're blowing trumpets in the street. Like this isn't like some made-up example. This is really happening in Jesus' day. Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, those rulers, right, are out there. I'm generous, right? That's their, I practiced that. That's what's embarrassing about that is that I practiced it. That's what they're doing. They got Louis Armstrong out there in front of them as they give. But before we throw stones, let's put our own toes out there so they can get stepped on by the word of God, right? Hear me. If a young person or anyone, for that matter, goes on a mission trip to Central America or Central Africa and doesn't get a selfie of themselves surrounded by a bunch of brown people, have they really gone on a mission trip? (laughs) I've done that. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. But why did I do that? What was the motivation of my heart, right? What was I trying to prove? I'm going to take those home so I can remember it? Maybe that's a good motive. Am I going to post that to social media so everybody sings my praises? Probably. That's what I'm probably going to do with it. We've got those giant checks, right? We like to give those giant checks and get the big photo op of us giving to the needy. Again, I'm not critiquing a selfie. I'm not critiquing a giant check. I'm asking us to check the motives behind the giving. That's what Jesus is saying. What is the motives behind the giving with all the social media humble brags that exist in the world? Right? We can get into this very easily where we give and our generosity is to be seen. I'm back, I, I, I was off Seinfeld for a while, now I'm just going to go every other week again. George Costanza gets caught taking money out of the tip jar at the restaurant that he put in there, but when he put it in there, the owner of the restaurant didn't see him do it, and so he had told Jerry Seinfeld earlier, he said, what's the point of the tip jar if they don't even see me put it in there? To which Jerry says, I guess you don't make a habit of giving donations to the blind. <laughs> he says, not particularly. Okay. That's the idea of this. The idea is, what is the posture of your heart? We're all guilty at some level. We give, but we want something in return, the recognition of other people. But God desires something different out of his people. Proverbs 27, 2, let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger not your own lips. And that's exactly the point Jesus makes in verses 3 and 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And this is a strange sentence. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When I was studying for this, and I'm saying this because it's the opposite of what the point actually is, I just thought it was funny that somebody wrote this they said, someone once said, some people don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing or giving because they don't want to embarrass the right hand, right? Like, it's just such a small gift that the left hand is giving that if the right hand knew about it, he'd just be so ashamed. That's not what it means at all. Um, but it was funny to me, so that matters. I just, see, and when it's funny to me, I feel like I'll share it with you, just take a chance. Maybe it'll be funny to you too. Obviously it wasn't. That's fine. The sentence, though, about our right hand and our left hand is hyperbolic. The point of verse 3 plays off of the point of verse 2 where the hypocrites are acting out their generosity for the praise of others. And what Jesus says is beware of doing that. Beware of doing it for the praise of others, but also beware of patting yourself on the back. Also beware of the praise of yourself for yourself. 
We might do it in secret, and then as we walk away from kind of doing it in secret, we say, hmm, I sure am good at I'm sure I'm a good person, aren't I? Nobody even saw it. Right. That's what he's warning us about, is that ego. It's to be a humble thing, even in your own heart. It's important to know this. This, this isn't about like covert generosity. This isn't about trying to like, you have to hide everything. And if anybody finds out that you were generous, then all of a sudden you lose your reward. So now we just got to like be ultra secretive, sneaking around to make uh, our donations to the needy. That's not the point. The point is the heart. Again, Proverbs 27, 2. Let another praise you. What's the posture of your heart, right? Is it, right, look at me? Or is it even if nobody sees me? Not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. It's about the motivation behind the generosity. Are you doing it for likes and heart emojis or so that you can be praised by others? Maybe you can finally like yourself, trying to soothe your own guilt in it. Or are you doing it for the glory of God alone? There's an author named Oz Guinness, uh, Dr. Oz Guinness. He says this, we who live before the audience of one. We're going to come back to that idea because that's what Jesus is talking about. Living before an audience of one. God himself. We who live before the audience of one can say to the world, I have only one audience. Before you I have nothing to prove, nothing to gain, nothing to lose. That's the idea. You can see even in that that God's desire for his children is for something better than the praise of man. Being free from the praise of man. The need for it. To live in, before the world with nothing to lose, nothing to prove, and nothing to gain because we live before an audience of one. We're going to come back to this quote again in the coming weeks because it's the same message over and over again with different examples for the next three weeks. But here's the point for today. When we are fully satisfied with God's eyes being the only eyes that see our generosity, we will be truly humble in our generosity. And that's the point of these four verses. True humility in your generosity, the way God calls us to enact it will only happen when we're fully satisfied with doing it before the eyes of God and God alone. So are you generous? Are you generous with your time, talents, and treasures for the sake of the kingdom or for your own sake? And more importantly, what are your motivations behind being generous? Is it to be praised by others or are you generous before an audience of one? That's today's example. But there's a bigger principle. Generosity is the example and our heart posture in being generous, being truly humble and fully satisfied in God's eyes, even if it's only His eyes that see us as we act generously. But shining through the example was an even, even bigger principle. You saw it. We read it. If you were to read the chapter in one sitting, you'll read it three times because Jesus is going to come back to it and say it again and again and again. That's a clue that Jesus is making a bigger point. It's not about just the giving example, although it's an important example, and we should think about it today. But he's making a bigger point. And that was at the end of verse 4. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Here's the principle that will overarch the next two examples. He's going to give an example about prayer and an example about fasting, these religious practices, and each time he's going to say that same thing. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. Even when nobody else recognizes what you've done, your father sees you. That's the principle that's overarching it, meaning to live before the audience of one is to trust him as a singular source of reward. And to believe that the reward of our Heavenly Father is better than the reward of any other source. To say the gaze of my Father is more valuable than the praise of others is difficult and requires faith. But it's the call of Jesus here 
in the Sermon on the Mount. So with that in mind, let's go back to the idea of our real human needs. Our real emotional human needs. We have an inborn need to matter. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. We're going to talk about this need to matter because it's going to undergird this idea of anxiety. Because you need to matter. You do. Whether you're willing to admit it today or not, you do. It's inborn inside of you. And if you go anywhere else but Jesus is the point he's making, you won't really have that need met. You need to matter. Chip Dodd says it like this. Mattering, he defines it, is, uh, mattering is being trusted by valued others for the continual expression of our core selves, our feelings, needs, desires, longings, and hope, and what is created out of them. We know we are being met in our need to matter when we become confident that what we bring through our personal expression of our particular passions adds to our community of belonging. That's in the sermon notes if you want to read it again. It's a lot of words, but here's the sum up. Our need to matter is a real need. It's put in you by God. Our need to matter is met when people we trust uh, value us for us. For who we are, like who we really are, not who we feel forced to be or who we pretend to be. So when you go to these two lists, that's why things like significance matters to us, why competence matters to us, why control or autonomy and affirmation do. So we're going to circle one today as we get ready to wrap this up. Significance. One of the ways we get jacked up in religion, even in generosity, is we think that we're going to get our significance from the eyes of man, from the praise of others, from the world around us saying, hey, good job. I like you. You're cool. You're getting it done. But what Jesus is saying is that there's a greater source of significance. We long to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Sometimes the reason we twist things up in life, the reason we malfunction religiously and just in general, is because we're seeking praise, we're seeking significance from the wrong places. Be honest with yourself today. This is part of the underlying thing that Jesus is saying when he says your father who sees in secret will reward you he's saying what your heart is longing for you think it's going to come from out here but it's not it's going to come from God through Jesus that's where you get it from here's the significance you were created for Revelation 21 1 through 5 hear this significance then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is a vision of the future that John, follower of Jesus, is given from God. And he writes it down in the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. I pray you feel something stirring in your heart when you read that. That taps into a longing that God has placed in your heart for all things to be made new. And then Jesus, the one sitting on the throne, says, Behold, I'm making all things new. He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You were made... For something so big that it changes you in the depths of the core of your being and changes everything to the furthest reaches of the universe. And that's not going to be whatever you call your destiny. 
It's not going to be whatever you call your dreams or your visions for the future in and of yourself. That's going to happen through the crucified and risen Jesus. At the end of time, making forever everything that is broken healed. Making all things new. That's what you were made for. And that is only found in God. Right? Like when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount about the hypocrites who have practiced their generosity for the praise of others, he says, they've had the reward. It's kind of a backhanded compliment. Yeah, they've had the reward, but they settled for something less. So much of this book, by the way, and so much of the Sermon on the Mount is a warning to you and me, don't settle for less. Take all that God wants to give you by following Jesus, by apprenticing with Him, by walking where He leads you, only in that place can you find what you're looking for. And God doesn't invite you into this as just some foot soldier or some cog in the wheel. He invites you as His children into this significant work of making all things new. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Here's the point. If, if you're a true Christian, your life has more significance than you could ever imagine. You are a child of the only God who through Jesus is making all things new from the core of your soul to the furthest reaches of the universe. And as he, as his child, child of him, you're a part of this kingdom reality. You're a part of him making all things new. Right? When he shows up in Revelation, he's already doing the work. And the work won't be finished until what we just read, but the work of making all things new is already happening right now, isn't it? If you wonder if it's happening, I mean, I could start calling people out in a good way up and down these rows and say, yes, Jesus is making all things new in this place. And the Sermon on the Mount is just one big announcement and explanation of the kingdom of God and an invitation to it. So might we have faith to believe that everything we need including these emotional needs at the core of who we are as people, is met in Jesus. That our need for significance finds its deepest satisfaction in hearing God say, you are mine, and as such, you are part of the greatest work of all time, making all things new. There's deeply rooted significance. In that place, you can live out generosity, like the example says today, without getting hung up on whether people see you or don't see you, whether people praise you or don't praise you, because you're a part of something infinitely more significant than the praise of man. Because your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Not just, right, it's not just a, a uh, you give away $10 and I'll reward you with $25. No, that's not, that's health, wealth, prosperity. That's not true gospel. And it's less it's such a silly thing to accept that our God would just be a cosmic vending machine. Give some money away, I'll give you some money back, maybe a little bit more than you gave away. No. He says, in my presence, you will find all that you need. Not just the food on your table, although he will. The righteous are not forsaken. But at the depth of your soul, he will give you all that you need. It's from that place that it's possible to be generous when we find our deepest significance in our Father. What's weird, though, or not weird, but ironic, is that that's only possible for us because of generosity. And not ours, but God our Father. Romans 8, 31 through 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Here's the generosity of God. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all?
things. That's the gospel. The root of your significance is the generosity of God the Father. At the root of your transformation into being a person who can be generous like the example without finding the significance of your generosity in the eyes of others, but instead finding it before an audience of one, that is found only through the generosity of God in Jesus. That's the gospel. You could not make yourself right with God. I could not make myself right with God, but God did not spare his own son. He gave him. Jesus died. In the place of me, in the place of you, he took the punishment that I deserved, took the punishment that you deserved. It was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And there, he drank every last drop of it so that he then could look at us and say, believe on Jesus and you'll be saved. You don't have to perform. You don't have to earn it. You come by faith believing that what Jesus did on the cross made it possible for you now to be brought into a right relationship with God, to be brought into a place of significance greater than you could have ever earned or imagined on your own. If you're not a Christian, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And if you have questions about what that means, I beg you and I pray the Holy Spirit will press upon you. Don't leave this place without talking to Pastor Josh or to myself about what it means to be a Christian. We would love to walk with you through that. And if you are a Christian, we already asked the one question, are you generous? And if so, what are your motives? That's an important one. And then here's the last one. Where are you seeking your significance? Is it in the eyes of man? Is it the praise of others? Or is it the rewards of the God who sees you in secret? Where are you seeking your significance? You don't have to apologize for that being a need that you have inside of you. But what we repent of is seeking that significance anywhere else but in the presence of God through Jesus Christ. So where are those places today for you, for me? I had some unearthed in my life this week. We're long, thank God. Thank, my wife's happy. I don't have to share what they were. But I had some places where I realized I was seeking significance here and it was crumbling. I had to repent. And you know what's so cool about God, our Father? He's not like us, right? Like, I, you know, maybe with your spouse. Maybe, maybe, probably not. Not here. Not anybody here. But, like, they apologize to you. And you're like, ah, they don't really mean it. They kind of mean it. I'm kind of glad they apologize. They don't really mean it. So I'm going to kind of cold shoulder them for a little bit. Just kind of give them a cold shoulder. We'll be a little more friendly than we were, but I'll just kind of cold shoulder them some. Strike a nerve. Then we start to think God acts like that towards us. If he doesn't, come to him. Say, man, I'm sorry, Father. I've been seeking my significance over here. He'll forgive you. He'll usher you into his presence with love and joy and compassion. And you'll find just a little bit more than you did before. It's my prayer. Believing just a little bit more than you did before that in the presence of your Father through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, everything you desire is yours in Him. Father, what a mess in the sense of like all of that, me trying to do it. I mean, and that's not even like self-deprecation. It's just true. Like that's so out of my, it's so out of my league to even be able to talk about the greatness of who you are. <laughs> so you have to give us faith to believe it. You have to give us hearts that are open to receive today that reality that our deepest source of significance in this world is not found in the praise of man for our generosity or for anything else but it is found before an audience of one. You are Father. Right, we experience today your loving gaze, not because we're special, but because Jesus was infinitely special and did what we couldn't do. So now you look at us through that lens, and so we are special in your sight, those of us who belong to you. 
If there's anyone who's not a Christian, I pray that they would choose today through faith to believe and that if they have any questions about that, they talk to a pastor so they too can walk in that same reality. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.